Hello, and welcome to the Daily Bible Podcast with Trisha and Michelle. We're just two friends reading through the Bible chronologically and encouraging you to do the same. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook, Daily Bible Podcast, or go to our website, dailybiblepodcast.net. We are going through the one-year chronological Bible, and we have links for that in our show notes and also at our website. Also join us on our thriving, fun Facebook group. Did that convince you yet, Michelle? Uh, Daily Bible (laughs) Podcast. And become part of this community of like-minded individuals who are reading through the Bible together. Also, subscribe to our podcast and help spread the word. Together, we can foster this incredible community Mm -hmm. and inspire more people to get into God's word. And speaking of Facebook, Julie in our Facebook group, she said that there are new layers as she's reading the Bible. There are new layers that are unfolding in her understanding of God's word. And I've got to say, I am right there with you. I feel like there are some things that have never come alive in my 40 some years of, of knowing God, because I was raised in a Christian home, raised going to church. And yet all of a sudden there's like some new revelations and I'm like, oh, wow. So yes, layers are unfolding for so many people. It's so cool. Okay. So today we are reading Zephaniah 2, um, 2 verse 8 through the rest of the chapter. Then we read Zephaniah 3, 2 Chronicles 35, verse 20 through 27, 2 Kings 23, verses 29 and 30, Jeremiah 47 and Jeremiah 48. Okay, so as we started off our reading today, we saw how God is using Zephaniah to share about the judgment against Moab and Ammon, and he is going to use his people to take revenge on them. And then he moves on to Ethiopia and Assyria, and he's talking about how they will be slaughtered by the sword, utter ruin, and how they will be a haven for wild animals Mm -hmm. like that just sounds utter devastation it's it just it sounds oh it sounds awful because then he goes on he says everyone passing by will laugh in derision and shake a defiant fist this is how we started Mm -hmm. our reading today folks shaking (laughs) that defiant fist and then he goes back to jerusalem And he's talking about their rebellion and their redemption and sorrow is coming. So we've got the bad, but then so is salvation. So all of a sudden we got a better picture of salvation. Listen to the end of verse eight in Zephaniah chapter three, for I have decided to gather the kingdoms of the earth and pour out my fiercest anger and fury on them and the, all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. Like only God can paint those words. Like we're, Mm -hmm. we're seeing such strength and anger, and then we're seeing such grace and love. Like I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can Mm. worship the Lord together. And so Does that make you kind of remember something that where all of our language got jumbled up and, you know, like maybe the Tower of Babel? Um, I know some people in um, our day now saying that social media um, or even AI, you know, artificial intelligence and what's happening there is the new Tower of Babel. But the exciting thing to know is that God is going to reunite are many and diverse mm-hmm. languages one day. Like that, and that's like, can you imagine like that? That to me is a new revelation to go, oh, like God's bringing yeah. all of that together. That's so cool. And then, of course, there's a balm for the heart then and now that is found in verse 17 of chapter three. And I've always loved this. This is my Lord... all time favorite verse, all time, is it? the whole Bible, like the top one right here. Go, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. That's so cool. Okay. Do you want to say it? No, go ahead. I want to hear you <laughs> say it. Okay. Uh, for the Lord, your God is living among you. He is a mighty savior. He will take delight in you with gladness, gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will j- rejoice over you with joyful songs. 
Oh, friend, he takes delight mm-hmm. in you. He calms all your fears and rejoices over you. Like, like that verse in itself is just mm-hmm. a reminder that God can be trusted. You know, it took the Israelites a long time to realize that he could be trusted. And some never did, but he can be trusted. And again, we see the cost of sin and we see the beautification of a repentant heart. Like God wants our hearts. He wants our whole hearts and he wants to delight in us, to delight over us. He wants that. So, okay, we just finished Zephaniah. And even though we finished another book, we need to keep in mind where we are in this historical narrative of the Bible. Just a couple of days ago, we read all that Josiah did to glorify God and bring him back to his rightful Mm -hmm. place in the hearts of his people. And remember, God promised Josiah peace and promised him that the impending doom would be held off because of his repentance. Well, during the later days of Josiah's reign, there was a geopolitical struggle between the declining Assyrian Empire and the emergent Babylonian Empire. So while Israel was at peace, these other empires were not. And the Assyrians made alliance with the Egyptians to protect against the growing power of the Babylonians. Like, like as I'm as I'm trying to understand all this, I'm like, oh, this is this sounds like present day what we do. Yeah. And and so anyway, going back to Bible days, the king of the Egyptians was Nico, and he was going to do battle with Carchemish. Josiah went to meet him, and Nico said that this wasn't anything to do with him. This was not anything to do with, with Israel. And so to stand back, because God had told Nico to hurry. And so Nico said, if you stand in my way, uh, I'm just going to have to destroy you. Well, Josiah got in Nico's way. And so Josiah disregarded, and this took me a while to really wrap my head around it because we had spent so much time with Josiah. Well, I felt we had, but I was like, no, he was a good guy. How could he disregard advice like this? But he had disregarded this good counsel from Nico and he stubbornly refused to heed the warning, which was actually from God. And he was hit by arrows and brought back to Jerusalem to die. And all of Judah and Jerusalem mourned for for King Josiah. And Jeremiah composed the funeral songs for his funeral. I thought, that's so cool. And of course, that makes sense. And then Josiah's son, Jehoaz, became the next king. So the end of an era. It's so interesting because it is. It's like, oh wow look at Josiah look at all he's doing this is so cool we really like this guy and you see this upward climb of all these things he's doing and then it's just like and he died (laughs) it was like what was that (laughs) I was like looking at like flipping the pages like did I just read that right like he just got shot and died like it's over that quick Um, oh it was a big production in in our home um when uh, as I was reading through it because I was like Joe do you remember this he was like nope And so we had all our study Bibles out and everything because I was like, help me understand this. Help me understand what's going on here because I don't want this to be true. But it was. I know. It's just like, don't be Zed. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, I just feel like, again, we've said this over and over. I just feel like I'm understanding everything so much better when it's all laid out together and it's we're following his story because before his story is a bit here and a bit there and a bit there and when a name just pops up once in a while you don't even think that's important and then when we read it all like this it just seems like so anticlimactic that he just dies Mm -hmm. but he did Mm -hmm. all right so jeremiah jeremiah 47 focuses on the prophecy against the philistines um again the word comes to jeremiah before Pharaoh attacks Gaza, indicating an impending invasion from the north, symbolized by waters rising over the land, and it represents the destructive force of the Babylonian army. So the invasion is said to be so horrific, uh, this part really, I like stopped and read it three times, terrified fathers run madly without a backward glance at their helpless children. 
Like they're just running for their lives. They didn't even pay attention to the kids are back there getting trampled. Um, so this is the sword of the Lord's judgment. Jeremiah 47, six says now, O sword of the Lord, when will you be at rest again? Go back to your sheath, rest and be still. So when mm. I was studying about this, I learned a new word. So let me see if I can Ooh. pronounce it right. It's proso. No, no, I'm not going to be able to say it. I like practices too. It's like, okay. Prosopia. Prosopia. Or how would you say that? Opia. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to let you go with that It's like an onomatopoeia, but it's a prosopopia. Prosopopia. That's what it is. Prosopopia. Okay. Okay. Or someone with an English degree, let me know how you really (laughs) pronounce that. But so this is a rhetorical device in which ordinary objects are given the voice to speak to themselves. So remember this, the sword, um, it's talking about the sword of the Lord. So it's like the Mm -hmm. Lord's, it's like the sword is speaking like about vengeance and all this kind of stuff. So that's a new word. I didn't know about when that object is given a voice. That's what that is. So the prophecy also foretells the end of the remnant of Anakim, which is a race of giants, and it depicts the despair of the cities of Tyre and Sidon and Gaza and Ashkelon. And the chapter ends with a rhetorical question from the sword of the Lord, asking how can it how it can rest when God has commanded it to be active. So the sword's like, how can I rest? The Lord has told me to do this. So a sword speaks in this <laughs> in this imagery. Um, in Jeremiah forty eight. It's a prophecy against Moab, which is a nation east of the Dead Sea. And the chapter describes a total destruction that will come upon Moab because of its pride and trust in works and treasures. Cities are named and their fates are outlined and it's imagery of desolation, weeping, mourning. And God declares that he will end the glory of Moab and break down its strongholds. Prophecy also points to the idolatry of Moab, particularly with the worship of Chemish, Shemish, which is pronounced, oh wait, Kamos, that's what it is, Kamos. And the Moabites believed Kamos was their supreme God. And if they were to make them happy, make him happy, if they were to make him happy, he would give them victory over their enemies. And sometimes this required human sacrifice. They were even sacrificing their sons to this Chemish. Um, and we read that the, uh, the, but God says that the idol would go into captivity along with the priests and officials. And it concludes with a note of hope that God would restore the fortunes of Moab in later days. Mm. And I think this is so cool. It says, what sorrow awaits you, O people of Moab, the Mm. people of the God Chemish are destroyed. Your sons and your daughters have been taken away as captives, but I will restore the fortunes of Moab in days to come. I, the Lord have spoken. And that's so cool because we hear that, you know, about Israelites being restored and, Judah being restored. Um, But God, I mean, he does care for these other nations. He just wants them to worship him. I think that was really cool that there's even a promise for Moab um, in this Mm -hmm. chapter of Jeremiah. We serve an amazing God. Mm -hmm. He really doesn't want to exclude anyone. Right. And yet he wants, he wants those who want him to be with him. Mm Mm-hmm. And so he is, he's going to make a way. He's going to make a way. He Mm -hmm. is an amazing God. Well, we need to take a break. We need to hear from our sponsor and then we need to come back with the word of the day. So stay tuned. Okay. The word of the day is delight which means great Mm. pleasure. So Mm -hmm. I love that in the middle of all these prophecies of destruction, we find the message of God's delight. And what is he taking delight in? You mentioned this, Michelle, in us. He takes delight in us. And so, like I mentioned, my all-time favorite verse, Zephaniah 3, 17, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears and he will rejoice over you with joyful songs. And the scripture is meaningful to me because for many years I saw God as like that overbearing father who's watching me in order to catch me doing something wrong. And I got to be good and I got to do everything right. And um, or God's going to be mad. And I didn't have a loving, doting father growing up um, who like someone I could turn to for love or advice or help. Um, and so I didn't see God like a had a hard time seeing God that way. And then I found this verse and it was like, God's like, this is who I am. Like, this is the type of dad I am. And so, yes, he's a mighty savior. He wants to help us and save us. 
but he delights in us. He delights in me with gladness. It, he's not just putting up with me like, oh, here she goes again. He delights in me. He will mm-hmm. calm my fears and he wants me to turn to him when I'm afraid. He rejoices over me with joyful songs. And that's my favorite part of the verse. And I picture this loving father singing lullabies over his child and the child can just relax, just like sink into that mattress and those songs are there and they have no worries in the world. And that's that picture just fills me with joy. Um, So these verses in Zephaniah 3 are bright spot and lots of messages of destruction. Um, And so I was thinking, like, what can we delight in? Um, And then I thought of the sword of the Lord because that whole imagery was really strong here. So the sword of the Lord represents divine judgment. I'm like, how can we delight in that? Yet the sword is in different ways too. In Hebrews and Ephesians, the sword represents the word of God. So Hebrews 4.12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So through God's word, we can distinguish right and wrong. And the sword is also a sort of judgment. Um, so there's a physical judgment and destruction, but there's also spiritual discernment and judgment. And so a broader sense, the sword represents authority and the power of God. So this is actually something we can delight in, whether it's spoken judgments against nation or his word judges our hearts and like really cuts through all the junk and gets down to what really matters. Like God has authority. And that's what we can like. We can look around and say all this hard, horrible, destructive stuff is happening, but God has ultimate authority. And that is something that we can delight in. So is our God strong and powerful judging nations? Yes. Is God's word strong and powerful, judging hearts? Yes. Um, Does this powerful God delight in us? Yes. Does he desire to calm our fears? Yes. So this God is a God of judgment. But for those who become his children, we can experience the tender and loving side of God. And this should bring us delight. It should bring us delight, even though it's hard sometimes. I'll pray like, Lord, show me what's in my heart that needs to be rooted out, but do it gently. Like, I know you're that loving father, but there are those things that need to be cut out. Um, And so we can delight that he does have authority and that he does have power and that he is delighting in us. Um, But he's also discerning and he also is going to point out the things that we need to work on because he loves us and he doesn't want us to be mired down or burdened down by those things. So growing up, I never was diagnosed with a learning disorder, but comprehension when I read has always been really hard for me. Mm. Like it's, it's not a, it's not necessarily because I'm not paying attention. It's just that usually the first, second, third, fourth time of reading something, it, it's maybe even the fifth or sixth, Mm. I'm not going to catch on. It's going to take me a while. And I was um, in my, probably my junior year of, of college. And I was in a professor's office. Um, He was professor head of the department of communication. So he had spent a a lot of time with me Mm. because of course, communication was my degree. Media studies was, and, and he, he sat me down in his office. So I was always in his office going, I don't get it. Like, especially with comp theory, I don't get it. I don't get it. Professor Mao. I don't get it. And, um, he just said to me, he said, Michelle, you are a delight to have as a student Mm. because I can tell you want to get it and you put in the time and you put in the effort Mm. and you're constantly asking like, what, what am I missing? What do I need to know? And he was like, your grades are not great because they weren't, they weren't for some of this stuff because I couldn't get it. He was like, your grades aren't great, but you're putting in the effort. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you are a delight. And that has meant the world to Mm. me to, to realize there in human standards, what delight meant because he, he was, he was my favorite professor. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I knew I could go to him whenever, but I always look at that. And I always go, that's how God sees me too. Mm -hmm. Is that like, as, as professor Mao said, I wasn't the best student. I mean, my grades stunk, but I was there because I wanted to learn and I wanted to be there. And he was like, and that's a delight. And I think of God going, yeah, you know what? You don't get it right all the time, but you are here and you want to be here with me. And so therefore I am delighted in you because you have my heart and I know, I know I have yours. 
And so that has, that's always been something that I look back on and I'm like, that taught me delight. That Mm -hmm. taught me how God delights in me. And I love that he spoke that into you. I can imagine how crushing it would have been been a professor that's like, you're never going to succeed and just like give up now. Mm -hmm. Like you wouldn't be doing this. You wouldn't be doing all the things that God had planned for you. And those words just spoke so much. And I, I love that. Um, you know, that's, that's something that you'd have playing over in your head. And like God does, like, I know you're trying, <laughs> like, I know yeah. you're trying to, it's almost like, uh, in the South, they say, bless her heart. Like sometimes I'll think <laughs> to myself, bless your heart. You're trying, like, yeah. you're not getting it right yet, but I, I bless my own heart sometimes like, oh, come on. But yeah, we're, we're trying, we're working on it. And I think God sees that effort. Like he sees that effort mm-hmm. and he delights in us and he sings over us. And how, like, we don't expect our toddlers to like, oh, you need to get everything right. You need to color in the lines and you need to stack the blocks perfectly. Like, we're not going to do that. We delight in them. We love them. Um, and yeah. yeah, God takes delight in us. Yeah, he does. Trisha, will you pray for us today that we would just bask in his delight? Mm-hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you delight in us. And I pray Mm. that that, just those those words would sink in. You delight in us. They will sink sink into our hearts. They will go deep into our hearts. They will just help us realize like, yes, we're going to mess up. Yes, we're going to fumble. Yes, we're going to have bad attitudes. Yes, we might be heading in the wrong direction sometimes. But you delight in us and you're going to sing over us and you're going to draw us to you, Lord. I pray that um, when we understand how much you truly love us, that we won't feel like we have to do everything right, but we'll just remember we can always come to you and you are there. And I thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we are sending you off with some daily encouragement to get into the word and be the hands and feet of Jesus. Again, if you don't have the one-year chronological Bible that we are using, we have links for that in our show notes. You can even find it in the Kindle format. Also in the show notes is a monthly and yearly schedule of the Bible reading plan that we are following. Okay, so tomorrow we are reading 2 Chronicles 36, verses 1 through 4, 2 Kings 23, verses 31 through 37, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 5, Jeremiah 26, uh, I missed it. Okay, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 5, Jeremiah 22, verses 1 through 23, Jeremiah 26, 2 Kings 24, verse 1 through 4, and Jeremiah 25, verses 1 through 14. So we're jumping around a little bit tomorrow Mm -hmm. or a lot tomorrow, but you got it? If not, just hit the, hit the rewind button 15 seconds and you'll, you'll, you'll hear it again. Or look in the show notes. They're also there too. Oh, that's right. They're in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to take a second here to thank the team at Life Audio. You would not be listening to Daily Bible Podcast without their partnership. LifeAudio.com is the place to go to find other great Christian podcasts that are going to encourage you in your walk with God. That's LifeAudio.com. And we will see you here tomorrow. Bye-bye.